reading from our Holy Gospel. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and have come into the world. And now I am leaving the world, and going to the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Throughout all of our three readings, they seemingly are disjointed. We have in Numbers, the fiery serpent placed upon the pole and set up for the people so that the people who were bitten by the serpent would look upon it and those who would look upon the, look upon the fiery serpent on the pole would be healed. And then, in, the, in our gospel text, we have exactly what I just, what I just read. In that day, or in this including, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be filled. What does that have to do with numbers? What, has to do, what does that have to do with our first reading? The bronze serpent and the biting of the snakes and the healing of those who looked upon the serpent on the pole. And then, to make things more confusing, we have James. James, the book that has been scrutinized by Lutherans for years and years and years. Because, upon first glance, the book of James looks to be saying that works are what gains you righteousness. But that's not what the book of James is saying. But it does seem that way in first glance here in our text. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face. For he looks at himself and he goes away and he forgets what it was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. So it sounds as if in order to have faith you must go and do and not just hear but go and do well what does that have to do with truly truly ask anything in my name and I will give it to you and the fiery serpents in the Old Testament Where's the common thread? Where's the commonality in those things? Well, first I point to you a quote that's often... Uh, well, it's, it's misquoted, but the, but the quote is, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. The idea behind that statement, while it sounds good, is that you are to be the gospel. You are to act in such a way that the, that the gospel reflects off of you, and people look at you and 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 and, and see the way that you, that your actions are, and then they say, "Well, if that's what it's like to be a Christian, I want some of that." I want to be that righteous, that good. I want to be the gospel too. 
But that's not what James is saying. In fact, I've got some news for you. It's the opposite. You can't be the gospel. The gospel is literally Jesus Christ, born of the virgin, uh, taught in his ministry, healed as epiphanies, suffered, well, well, let's even take it back. Triumphantly entered into Jerusalem, was arrested, tried, beaten, suffered, died, was buried. The third day he rose again, approached his disciples, and then descended into hell, then ascended into heaven. That's the gospel. Good luck being that. So that's obviously not what James is saying. So what is James saying? Well, let's look at our other texts. In Numbers, we have this word, these words that come up and they're words that are very hard to ever take back. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So they're talking about the manna that comes out uh, in, in the desert for them to eat. Now, note, note that this is a miracle. That there's bread on the ground as they wake up. And so much that they can't bring it all in. And they call it worthless. Ultimately, what they're saying is that we were happier being slaves to Egypt than being free in Yahweh. They were happier being slaves to Egypt than being free in Jesus. And they blamed the preacher. They blame Moses. Why, ha why have you brought us out of this land to, to eat or to, to starve when you know, we were slaves, but at least we could eat? And now we have this food that we don't even like, even though it's God-given and a miracle. And so in times of peace and in times of of, of no struggle, it's easy. It's, it's, it's easy to say, why be faithful? It's easy to say that. Or it's easy to become complacent. But believe me, the thing that t turned America into an anti-Christian nation is apathy. The thing that rips faith out of Christians is apathy. The being neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, being spewed out of the mouth of God, is apathy. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that. Well, whoever asked you what you needed to do? The gospel is what's been done for you. You can't do that. You can't be that. You can only receive it. And so, when these people in the wilderness are saying, I would we would rather be slaves to Egypt, it's like us saying, we would rather be slaves to sin than free in the gospel. Because it's not popular and it's a famine in the world. Then we come to our gospel text and we see truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. Now again, this is something that can be taken out of context and, 
and, and placed on a t-shirt or on a poster or something like that and it will and, and, and it will it will be our human human uh, device to, to, to manipulate it and, and to move it and to say well then I can do anything as long as I ask God one thing led to another you have Appalachian snake handlers or you have prosperity gospel which is worse Anything that you ask of the Father in my name, I will give to you. My whole life, I have wanted a Corvette and perpetual New York Yankee World Series wins year after year after year. The Father has not seen fit to grant me these things. That's an example of poor prayer, of course. But what about the things in what about the what about the things in life that you can't do without? I have one son. I found out this morning that a good pastor friend of mine has one son. Or he did last night. This morning He doesn't have a son. It puts things into perspective, doesn't it? What would you ask in the Father's name? Time after time after time, and night after night after night, and pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray my Lord my soul to take. And we pray that prayer over and over and over. And then one day, it happens. A child lays down to sleep forever. So what's the thread in all three of these readings? Pray. Pray. What does it say in our Old Testament text? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to eat this worthless food? We were better off in Egypt than we are with God. And so fiery serpents came and bit the people. And all of a sudden, they were super repentant, which will happen with fiery serpents. And so they went back to the pastor, to, to Moses, and said, Moses, we have sinned against God and against you. You go to God and ask Him to, to stop this. That's prayer. Moses, here are the colics. That's, what, that's the word that we use. We have, we have collected all of our prayers. They all happen to... They all happen to uh, 
be relative around fiery serpents, but here is all of our prayers. Take these prayers before God so that, so that these snakes will stop biting us. Moses goes and he says, Lord, my people are repentant. Would you please have mercy on them? And God says to Moses, put a serpent on a pole. And when, that, when you raise that serpent up, anyone who was bitten and looks upon that serpent will live. That's prayer and an answer. You are sinners. You have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed. A serpent came among us long ago tempting Adam and Eve. And from that point onward, it escalated rather quickly from eating fruit to right straight out murder. And we haven't been improving things. So pray. Pray. Pray like the Israelites who were bitten by serpents. Pray like your soul and life depends on it. Pray because, because you are sinners. Pray to be forgiven. And your, and, and, and your Father in Heaven will hear those prayers. And I, this is, when people ask, what, what pastors do and they joke about well they only work one or two hours a week it's, it's funny but uh, the, the time on, on my knees and the time on pastor's knees is of the most important time a pastor can spend to pray for his people I don't consider myself a, a man of the character of Moses, but I do consider myself a man in the role of Moses, where I take your prayers and I kneel and I pray weekly and daily for you, for you, for your help, for your forgiveness, for all the things that you need. And now I must add to my prayers the mourning of my friend whose son has died. But on your side of the sin, on your side, where, where we say in this world we can see no good, in this world we see horrible things, in this world we see and we contribute to the evil, damnable actions of this world, then we say, whoa, maybe it wasn't so good when we were slaves to sin and slaves to Egypt. Whoa, sin is real and it takes our children and it takes our parents and it takes those who we love, cousins, aunts, uncles. The wages of sin is death. And then all of a sudden, it's like a fiery serpent burning you and we turn our attention right back to the church. And we say, pray for us so that God will have mercy upon us. And I, like Moses, turn and say, behold the fiery serpent upon the pole. Christ the crucified. That prayer has been answered already. Repent and be forgiven. See the serpent. See your sin laid upon a Savior who is sinless so that you can have the forgiveness of sins. That though we may be separated between here and heaven, there lies the bridge between the chasm. So when James says, don't be just hearers, be doers, he's saying, pray. Pray to the Lord your God. 
Pray for your neighbors. Pray for those who have lost children. Pray for those who have lost parents. Pray for those who have lost, who have lost all financially. Pray for those who are in pain. Pray for those who have done you wrong. Pray that your sins would be forgiven. And then look upon the cross, the serpent upon the pole. And it's also one of the reasons why I love our altar cross so much. Because that's not a dying Christ. That's a dead Christ. And the way that his bones are disjointed, it's very serpentine. Like a serpent. The one who knew no sin became sin for you. And those who look upon it with baptismal eyes will live. And then we have a whole new perspective of all of our readings. As well as life, nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, nor angels, nor demons. Nothing in heaven, and nothing in hell can separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even And I can't imagine what he's going through right now. Losing a son. And you know what he had to do today? He had to put one of these on. And he had to go give people hope. And that's why we Lutherans preach the Word. Because it's the only thing that gives us strength. It's the only thing that gives us a promise. It's the only thing that tells us there's more to this life. After this world is burned away, there will be the Word made flesh. And nothing else matters. Live or die, there is only Christ. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you are baptized and believe, I can't downplay pain. But I also don't have the words to explain the exuberant joy that is to come in heaven. I wish I did. But to be quite honest, I'm going to be just as excited and surprised as you are. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And now may the peace for